Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast about foreign policy and world affairs. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. And in this show, we discuss topical global issues, have conversations with foreign affairs thought leaders and newsmakers, and give you the context you need to understand the world today. Go to globaldispatchespodcast.com to learn more. And now on with the show. My guest today, Todd Moss, is the founder and executive director of the Energy for Growth Hub. This is a brand new organization. It seeks large-scale solutions to end the kind of energy poverty that can stifle industrial and commercial development in the developing world. We kick off talking about energy poverty, specifically why the traditional definition of that term may be an inadequate understanding of the problem. We then have a lengthy discussion about the link between big-scale energy solutions, global development, and climate change. I must say, our conversation changed the way I think about energy poverty and energy solutions in the developing world, which, as Todd Moss explains, is the driving purpose of this new organization. Todd Moss has been on this show before, almost four years ago, in fact. In episode 55, he discussed his life and career as an international development expert and as a critically acclaimed novelist. He writes political thrillers set in the developing world. I'll post a link to that old episode on globaldispatchespodcast.com. And if you're listening on iTunes, you can find that old episode by subscribing to the podcast as opposed to just listening to shows on an ad hoc basis, uh, that opens up the entire archive of previous episodes to you. And while you're on globaldispatchespodcast.com, you can also use the contact button to send me an email if you have suggestions of people you want me to interview or topics you want me to cover. All right. Now here is my conversation with Todd Moss, founder and executive director of the Energy for Growth Hub. Well, you know, people mean different things when they when they say energy poverty. Lots of people think of energy poverty as meaning you don't have light lights at home. Um, and that is a problem for about a billion people um, around the world. They, they do not have modern electricity at home, even the most basic electricity. Um, but when I think about energy poverty, it's it's about is the lack of access to electricity and other forms of energy, is that enabling me to live up to my full human potential? Or is that a barrier uh, to me as an individual or to my society achieving our goals? And there, at least 3 billion people, so three times more people, live in economies where, you know, the power goes out a lot. And that is a really a first order problem uh, for people living in those countries. So it's it's a more expansive definition of energy poverty that you take when you're looking at sort of whole of society effects of the lack of reliable electricity. That's right. I mean, I think the the for, the, the the typical way, the you know, no lights at home, I think of that as extreme energy poverty, kind of like we have extreme income poverty below, you know, a dollar a day. Um but the concept of energy for growth that we're trying to promote is this idea of energy um, as a an accelerator and an enabler for the wider economy, um, and that is really this you know th- this notion of do you have enough energy to run all of the machines uh, and data centers and buildings that you need for a modern economy? So, correct me if I'm wrong, but like in the developed world, like here where I'm sitting, you know, Excel energy provides me my household energy, but presumably it also, you know, provides energy, you know, to the factory like a mile away. Um, Is how is that like different in developing world contexts? Well, it's not necessarily different. You know, you, you when you and I turn on, you know, the television at home or the air conditioner at home, we don't actually really, you know, very few people know where their electricity comes from. Um, they might know that, that their bill comes from the utility, um, but those utilities are also, you know, are also providing power for all of the hidden things in an economy that people just thinking about household electricity don't, don't always see. Like what? So, so, well, it's, it's all of the, all of the embedded energy in, 
you know, in your car, in the everything that you buy that's manufactured, in the data centers that are running um, that enable internet to work. It's in everything, you know, in a steel factory. It's literally modern, you know, energy is embedded in everything about a modern life. And what we you what we consume at home is actually just a tiny fraction uh, of the energy that is part of the way we live um, and is part of, you know, it's the foundation for um, for living a, a, a high income, high consumption life. And And so like in the developing world, like household energy um, comes from one source while like industrial energy might come from another. Is, is that right? Well, it differs a lot. It depends. It depends where you're talking about, you know, um, even, even within Africa, you've got a lot of different, um, a, a lot of different situations, but what's, what appears to be happening is that in a lot of markets, you know, typically, you build a modern power system, you build large power plants and a grid um, first for large industrial customers. And that's partially because of the financing and the way that you you make uh, these large investments financially viable. Um, and then the, the residential use comes kind of as an add on. Mm-hmm. That's what we did in the United States. We industrialized first and then, you know, rural rural households were the last ones to electrify. Um, but now in you know large parts of the world, um, there are options for residential uh, electricity through different forms. You don't have to wait for the grid. You can do some kind of distributed system, um, and which is fantastic for residential uh, residential electricity and for very basic appliances. But it's not it's not sufficient uh, for higher income uh, residential consumers. So you can run lights on a solar home system. You can't run an air conditioner on solar home systems, um, or at least not the not the not the the regular small ones um, that are that are common in in Asia and Africa. Um, and you definitely can't run uh, you know a steel plant um, or data centers right now on small energy systems. So, uh, like, what does it take, and, and what are you trying to do with your new initiative to? kind of bring big energy ideas, energy solutions um, to the kind of scale that you describe as, as sort of necessary to sustain and propel growth? Yeah. So, I mean, I think at one level, we're trying to promote this notion that is starting to catch on, which is that energy is 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 development. It's It's not just essential, but energy is part and parcel of what we think of as development. This is true in the data. You, If you look, um, you know, there is no rich high income country in the world where per capita uh, electricity consumption is less than around 5000 kilowatt hours per person in the US uh, it's the average is around 13000 and in a place like Nigeria uh, it's only 150 so we're talking you know 1% you know an average nigerian will use 1% of the electricity of an average american and and that kind of Distinction runs through um, globally through all data. Um, you can also see, you know, I live in uh, outside Washington D.C. I work one block away from famous K Street, um, and K Street's got a little over a hundred big office buildings. Um, K Street, Washington D.C., uses about the same amount of electricity as the nation of Liberia. So we're just talking about huge, huge gaps here. Um, and so, you know, we want to promote this idea of, of energy as development and also really to try to get people to think about energy poverty um, at a scale and at an ambition that's consistent with what uh, how what countries see for themselves, uh, what kinds of economic transformation they want. And so, again, it's about building help helping to build systems that can support a modern economy and especially job creation not just uh, get lights uh, and phone chargers into into people's homes and let them stay poor. So, so can you walk me through, like, what does a system like that look like? I mean, are there any, for example, good examples out there right now of a developing world country who kind of created a, a, a good system that provides energy for their people, um, you know, at, at a scale that's necessary to support economic growth and, and industry? 
Yeah. So look, there there are you know there are countries that are doing some things right. There are lots of countries not doing uh, the right things. I think probably the example of the country that's done it well and done it the fastest is is uh, Vietnam, um, and they've really uh, invested heavily in you know, a a diverse energy sector that's supportive of job creation and has helped to fuel high economic growth. Um, I don't want to pick on Kenya, but as a counterexample, you know, Kenya um, has has really prioritized residential uh, electrification, um, and they've signed a lot of different kinds of of deals. um, And what that has done is given them a kind of transactional approach to trying to sign lots of power plant deals, but without looking at the overall system and what that what that future demand will look like and who can pay for it. Um, And so I think we we would hope that we can use some of the data and evidence out there to encourage countries to take more of a systemic approach rather than just try to sign lots of construction deals, um, but try to look at what kinds of energy their economy will need, not just today, but when you're building infrastructure that's going to be with you for 30 or 40 years, what kind of economy are you trying to build for the next generation? So, so you mentioned Liberia earlier. I mean, you know, if you were to like wave a magic policy wand and, and sort of design a really effective energy infrastructure for Liberia that could sustain industry and, and growth, what does that look like? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, sh- you I laugh. Should this is your job. Like, no, look, I, I would preface this by saying, you know, th- this whole model of foreigners uh, flying in for a couple of days and telling countries uh, what they should do. I think that model is, you know, fundamentally passe. It just doesn't work. I guess what I'm um, trying. I guess what, what I'm trying to, yeah. to ask is like, could you try to like make this real to me? Like, I know very little about energy infrastructure and and what it means. Like, what yeah. would like a functioning system look like? Where does the energy energy come from? How is it distributed? Yeah. Um. How is it sort of sustainable? Like, what sure. what does it? Yeah. I mean, like in general, like what does it look like? Yeah. Look, those those are great questions, and you know, um. In each place, every country is going to exploit its endowments. Okay, so a country like Liberia, they have a lot of hydro potential. They have a lot of solar potential. Um, and that's going to look very different from um, a nearby country, Ghana, which has a lot of natural gas. Um, so every country is going to, you know, where where what's the most sensible mix? That's going to depend a lot on the geography and on the economics of, of energy in each place. The, the basic fundamental uh, questions countries should be asking, though, is what kind of an energy system do we need to support not just residential electricity, um, but to, su- to support job creation uh, for decades to come? Um, and I think that this is really quite an urgent issue. It's not it's not something far off in the future, because if we look across Africa, we now have um, at least 10 million young people joining the job market every year. Uh, and if the future of Africa is low energy, that is a uh, that is a jobless future. And that is not a future that I think anyone um, anyone wa- wants to see. So. What's the role for of like carbon intensive energy sources like say coal in in this model um, where you know you need cheap and reliable electricity to fuel economic growth but what if that comes from something like coal? Yeah, so look, I think if we take a if we step back for a second and we look at the um, at the carbon emissions coming from low income countries, they're they're absolutely minuscule. Um, you know, the average African contributes almost nothing to global carbon emissions. Um, you know, do we want is it is it good for Africa and for the world for them to build their future on coal? Absolutely not. Um, fortunately, there are very few countries in Africa that are betting on coal. South Africa is really the only um, the only coal uh, country uh, of any significance. Well, also, the wealthiest country in the region. <laughs> sure. Sure. But the, the, I think the, the rubber really hits the road on gas. And that is because there are lots of African countries that are discovering gas um, and they are developing those resources in partnership with 
um, with, uh, with Western and Asian companies. Uh, and the question is whether all of that gas is just going to be exported to Asia and Europe, or is some of that gas going to be used to develop uh, energy resources at home? Um, and there, I think, you know, again, that's going to come down to individual countries. Um, you know, I think Nigeria and Ghana are two countries where gas is absolutely going to be part of the mix. Uh, if you look at Ethiopia, Ethiopia is going to be mostly hydro. Uh, Kenya, I was picking on Kenya a little bit before. Their future is actually mostly geothermal. They've got incredible geothermal potential. So um, and they're all, they're already uh, starting to exploit that. So I think that mix is going to depend a lot on local conditions. Um, but I think it's important that we not try to put barriers in the way for countries that are still low income. There's still a lot of poverty and they're still very, very energy poor um, that they should uh, not be allowed for some reason to develop resources um, that they have. Um, and, I, you know, I'm often reminded, I, I, you know, my office is in Washington, D.C., the power in Washington, D.C. comes from a company called Pepco. Um, and there, you know, Pepco is paying for the air conditioning and lights at U.S. government agencies and at the World Bank. And it, th that power is 95 percent from coal, gas and nuclear. Um, and so, you know, there's more than a little whiff of hypocrisy if those agencies are then going to try to block um, block countries from from developing uh, their their own resources. But it is it is a trade off, though, right? I mean, it, but it's one that you're willing to accept in like certain circumstances that you know a country, you know, should be able to embrace some carbon heavy, um, you know, electricity development, energy development, um, you know, because we in the United States that's how we built our economy and how that's how we sustain our economy. Well, look, I don't think it's, it's not up to me or to you, you know, to make those decisions. What I do think is that w we want to view these things as trade-offs. All energy systems come with trade-offs. You know, there's a big um, article in the Washington Post this weekend um, that Georgetown University is trying to build, trying to go carbon free. And they were trying to build a large uh, solar plant in, in uh, you know, outside Washington, D.C. And the local community is blocking them because they didn't want the trees torn down. Huh. Um, so, look, every energy source comes with certain trade offs. And I just think we in the West, because we have levers over some of the financing mechanisms, we should not use those in a way that don't recognize those trade offs and that that certain decisions. For example, if we banned countries from you accessing finance to build natural gas fired power plants, that that will lead to unemployment, early, you know, er, uh, poorer health greater poverty like we do need to recognize um those those trade-offs but but mark i do want to just be very clear about the effects of climate change particularly on tropical uh economies uh in sub-saharan africa you know the the effects of climate change on these on these uh countries and on the people living in those countries is going to be tremendous um if we start to and, and this comes back to the kinds of energy systems that that countries should be building, um, you know, if we think about what the effects of climate change will be on Africa, it's things like extreme weather, rising temperatures and uh, increasing scarcity of fresh water. So what are what are African economies going to need to deal with that? Uh, they're going to need for extreme weather. They're going to need steel and concrete to build resilient infrastructure. For rising temperatures, they're going to need a lot more air conditioning and cold storage. And to deal with freshwater scarcity, they're going to need desalination and more pumped irrigation. Now, I just named six of the most energy intensive technologies out there. Um, and so I think the realities of climate change mean that Africa and emerging Asia is going to need more energy, not less. So, you know, we've spent the last, you know, 15 minutes or so really like, I think, laying out the challenge ahead of you, um, at energy for growth. What, um, what are you going to do about it? Like, like, what do you see the role of, of your new initiative in trying to sort of take on aspects of this challenge? Yeah. So look, it's, it's a huge and daunting <laughs> challenge. There's no question about it. And it is something, you know, I, I think that this, that this problem of, of, of creating a, you know, a high energy future for everyone is something that will um, keep me busy for at least the rest of my life. Um, but what we're trying to do is really try to shift the conversation in two ways. 
The first is to get people, try to get people to think about energy poverty in places like Africa at a different level. And I mean that in, in two senses. One is that everyone thinks about residential. They don't think about energy for industry and commerce. Um, a lot, you know, the vast majority of energy is not used at home for lights. It's used in industry and commerce for, uh, in, in the wider economy. Um, and it's also, you know, an issue that's going to be right at the forefront because a lot of countries are approaching 100% um, access. That is, they're going to, they're getting very close to everyone having electricity at home. But lots of these countries still have major power problems. Power is holding back their economies. And this is, you know, Ghana is going to hit universal access in the next couple of years. Pakistan is almost at universal access. Even South Africa is almost at universal access. These are economies where the power goes out all the time. It's a major constraint to industrial and job growth. Um, and they're going to have to solve this problem. Um, so if we only think about it as household access, that's a problem that will be solved in my lifetime. Um, but the problem of, uh, of the bigger problem of energy for growth will not be solved, um, uh, you know, that quickly. Um, so, so we're really thinking about it. I want people to think about the wider role of energy uh, in the economy, not just household. And the second is that the scale we're thinking about it is wrong. Um, you know, people immediately think of lights. Um, but really, if you think about energy and development, we should be thinking about air conditioning and heavy machinery. That is what drives um, that is what drives uh, development. And this is also true you know, in a services economy, data centers require, they have to be cool and they have to run all the time. They require a ton of energy. Um, and I really think a lot about um, this, the lessons from cell phones. Now, I've never given a talk on energy and development and not had somebody ask about, well, what about mobile phones? You know, people, people skipped landlines um, and went right to mobile. Can we do that with, with energy? So there is a very important lesson from cell phones, but it's not necessarily that the grid is no longer needed. Um, the lesson from cell phones is that you can charge your phone at home with a single small solar panel, um, but that charging is less than 1% of the energy that you need for a smartphone to actually uh, operate. The other 99% of the energy comes in running the cell towers, the data centers, and in actually manufacturing the phone. So it appears like it's a low energy technology, but it's actually a high energy uh, technology. So we're trying again, so that's the big picture, trying to get people to think about energy poverty in a more ambitious and a more holistic way than just lights in poor people's homes. And then at the second, the kind of one tier down, the Energy for Growth Hub is a global network of scholars and researchers and policymakers working on solving um, this problem. Uh, and we want to try to bring evidence and data to help countries make uh, to make good decisions, to make smart investment decisions about their own energy future. And this is really, you know, the, the mission here is to try to help countries access tools and evidence and uh, experience um, rather than uh, just going by ideology or going by the next shiny gadget that someone is, is trying to sell them. Um, and, and one example of this really is the, the revolution in big data and satellite imagery. There is just a huge potential to utilize these tools um, uh, for countries to make smart decisions. Where does the grid go next? Which parts of the country does it not make sense to extend the grid and where distributed energy systems make the most sense? And that's why we're just, for example, we're really proud to be working with our colleagues at MIT that are that are working on this exact uh, this exact issue. That's uh, always good to name drop MIT. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, look, I think it's you know it's important. I mean, one of the reasons we uh, that that we started the hub is that people at at places like MIT and Berkeley and Stanford and Chicago and Columbia, you know, a lot of people are doing incredible amounts of work that's very, very relevant uh, to the problems that, that countries are facing and the decisions that that policymakers have to make. But the incentives and the language of academia uh, do not um, do not bode well for actually connecting, uh, yeah. connecting those dots. Yeah. And that's actually the role of the hub is to help 
get some of that um, some of that data and research into both translated into a format that that policymakers can act on and to help do some matchmaking, try to put that person at MIT who's doing the cutting edge work in touch with the person on the ground in a particular country who can utilize um, those new tools. That, that is, that's interesting. You know, it's like a common uh, refrain that I often hear talking to people in international relations circles, that academic research on international relations, um, you know, has a lot to contribute to policy, but policymakers never really access it. And the two sort of silos, the policymakers and the academics never talk to each other. But it seems like what you're doing is sort of solving, um, solving that problem, sort of bridging that that very specific gap on energy issues, which is really interesting. Well, we're trying to do it in a very niche way. Um, but look, I, you know, I, I was a, uh, I am a researcher on the outside. I went, I had the great fortune of going into the state department. Something that really stuck in my head was, you know, I was doing work on, on aid effectiveness. Um, and it was all driven by, uh, multivariate regression analysis. And then I went into the state department and not once, not once in my entire time in the state department, did anyone show me a regression table? Like that was just, that, for me, that was just a good <laughs> kind of microcosm of the problem um, that, um, that we're trying to solve. And it's not that policymakers should start looking at regression tables. I actually don't think that that's feasible. It's trying to get, um, trying to get good researchers who care, and many of them do not, but those who care about getting their work into the real world getting them to try to um, put it into a format uh, and a language that is um, that is accessible without losing the nuance. Uh, well, Todd, thank you so much for your time. Good luck. It, it sounds exciting. I'll be interested to see where uh, your, your startup uh, develops and goes. Great. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Todd. That was helpful and interesting. And uh, as I said at the outset, it really did change my own thinking on how to think about energy poverty. All right, see you next time. Bye.